Um, what we'd like to show with you today um, is just walk you through sort of how uh, Amazon Managed Workflows for Apache Airflow was built, some of the design decisions that we had, um, and really about, um, not just specifically about what, um, you know, how it works on, on our implementation, but really to share sort of some of the considerations that we made and also, uh, you know, how that might apply, whether you are using our managed service or just, you know, building your own Airflow uh, environment or cluster, you know, some of the things you might want to consider when you're doing that. Um, so just sharing our slides here, we'll show our, um, uh, what we're going to be covering. Um, so we'll really talk to, so I'll just, you know, I'm going to give some, uh, a bit of an introduction to sort of what our, why we started with this service in the first place. And then I'm going to hand off to Subash, who's going to really cover, you know, our whole journey of this process, really, you know, how we had to learn about Airflow, um, and really understand it from the community's point of view. And then really, you know, what's driving us, what's making us so excited about uh, this fantastic open source project and, and our, our, um, our involvement in it. So really why we built this in the first place is customer, customers really reached out to us and said, you know, can, can we um, help with the, the creation of Airflow? Can we make it easy to manage it and operate it? Um, you know, can we make our, you know, uh, our, our data engineers more efficient, right? Can we really let them focus on their data pipelines and their data needs and not focus so much on the administration of it? And then can we also make it easy to scale? I mean, really just make it so that we can have as many environments or as many workers or really make it as easily as possible. But importantly, do all that without touching Airflow itself, making sure that Airflow is the same community version that, um, that everyone's currently using today. And so this presented quite a challenge. And so uh, I'll, with that, I'll hand it over to Savash to explain sort of how that journey uh, progressed and uh, how, we, how we went forward with that. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today, I wanted to talk you know, a little bit about our interesting learnings and decisions that we made during the development of uh, MWA. Firstly, we were a team of software engineers. So we had to understand the domain in which Airflow operates. And most importantly, we have to learn to think through the lens of a data engineer to truly understand the use cases of the system. So that was one of the uh, you know, really initial things that our team set forward to do, to understand Airflow, the premise of the, uh, you know, uh, the tool, and what is, uh, what is it used for in, uh, from our uh, customers. We knew from day one of our development process that customer success for um, MWA it's the same as the success of the community itself. So we made the effort to understand, uh, you know, all the past AIPs that have gone through in Airflow. We went and we went and you know read all of them, try to understand how Airflow evolved as a system uh, to really serve our customers better. So one of the things that we were really uh, intrigued by, and also our customers corroborated the same, is um, how much they love Airflow's openness. And, and, and the flexibility of the system. And that is why you know, it is you know, ubiquitous and popular uh, among you know, most data engineers uh, that are working with the data pipelines. And with that flexibility comes the positive challenge to us on building a service that can accommodate the various configuration styles that customers use. No two customers' Airflow environment is the same. You know, there's, there's so many knobs for the right reason, and they, they are all effectively used uh, to exactly match the customer use cases uh, on-premise. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with this diagram and architecture by now. Um, John and Sam covered this in their session. Every choice that you see in here, both in terms of either a networking, security, or a technical choice, it has been, you know, uh, there, there is customer stories and uh, deep thought process associated with each one of those choices. And I wanted to share some of those choices, uh, which, you know, I thought would be interesting um, uh, for all of you. So let's talk about uh, how we deploy code in MWA. So we have a, an interesting choice here where um, we tend to differentiate pre-prod airflow environments from production environments. What we really mean by that is um, when we asked our customers about how do you deploy your code, we realized that their bar and the cadence for how they update their DAGs completely varied from how they updated uh, their airflow plugins and configuration and requirements. That really pushed us to think, you know, uh, with with a dual model where, 
you know, there should be a low bar of entry for updating your DAG because it's code chickens that are uh, flowing through pipelines. At the same time, we need to ensure that there is a high degree of deployment safety when uh, when customers update plugin and requirements because it has potential to cause disruptions in their production workflows. So this is the reason why we chose to you know, make plugins and requirements explicitly versioned and uh, requiring the customers to do an update request um, because customers preferred that they want to do it safely uh, uh, as opposed to doing it in a really fast manner on production environments. The next thing that uh, you know, I want to talk about is authentication um, and authorization. So customers asked us if they could use their existing um, permissions and user management layer that they've already set up for their organization on IAM. And they wanted to do directly use that on the uh, Airflow environment that they create. So this presented an interesting challenge because this, was, this use case was not implemented before. We didn't have an IAM specific IDP layer plugin uh, before this. So we set out to you know, see you know, how we could help our customers with that. Turns out, I mean, it was already you know, uh, very well made for us because Airflow already had a robust RBAC control and pluggable authentication model. So this enabled us to build um, a plugin layer that supported IAM-based authorization and authentication for our customers. So the, the resulting you know, um, uh, you know, effect of this is that we have a really simple single-click, single sign-on single sign uh, experience from the AWS console directly into uh, your Airflow uh, UI. And we take care of like you know uh, padding whatever you've configured as users and permissions on the IAM side into the uh, uh, you know Airflow our back controls, and we are actually really thrilled about the reception that we have got on this feature from our customers because they do not have to maintain two different identity stores and manage syncing between both of them. So, um, and one of the most important things our customers ask for is um, on-demand scaling and, and of their workers. And we chose um, to go with Celery um, you know, for this use case. So uh, customers, when it, when it came to on-demand worker sc uh, scaling, the choice was here to provide a good balance of being able to scale quickly and, uh, and efficiently and balance that out with cost optimization provided by uh, you know, packing more density on a per worker level. So we also allow customers to choose the task density according to their needs. We also provide them the ability to choose minimum and maximum amount of workers for provision capacity to handle surge in task volume. Uh, one of the things I want to actually call out here is a, a huge shout out to the community for that excellent work on the Kata Autoscaler. Uh, I mean, when we were developing our um, celery based um, uh, autoscaling, and that was, you know, by the, by the end of it, we actually saw the Kata Autoscaler came out. It felt like we were thinking on similar lines and it really reiterated the value to uh, the customers in the choice that we went with. And, and, and lastly, uh, I wanted to touch base on storage and, and you know, our choice on uh, storage itself. So we considered a range of options when we developed this, like including network file systems with provision IOPS and uh, you know, container-based mounting uh, of network file systems. We even considered code repositories outright, like you know, with the syncing mechanisms. Turns out um, you know, uh, the customers needed consistent reads as a single source of truth. And on the other hand, the, the developers thought that uh, Airflow being a system that reads uh, you know, Python files locally on disk, we need, we need to make sure that there is good uh, amount of local IOPS available uh, you know, when you're reading all those DAGs. So that is the reason why we went with S3 um, in, for its durability and uh, the familiarity of uh, usage. And it's a really simple API for customers uh, and it provides customers a flexibility to set up any style of CI CD pipeline they want to build on top of S3. Um, yeah, so that, that is the reason why it was a natural choice for us. And I think we did cover some of the CI CD um, use cases in our previous talk. Uh, and we do have, uh, you know, uh, in future, we'd be writing, you know, we intend to write more. Uh, guidelines on how to set a varied amount of CI/CD setup, uh, which eventually funnels into the, the S3 bucket. So now that you know we've shared some of like um, you know, what why we took some decisions and uh, what are the interesting learnings we had, we want to share what we are excited about as a team uh, about Airflow 2.0 and beyond. So our, our team, you know, is always uh, are fascinated by how much of discussion we have on our AIPs, the clarity of thought uh, all of the community um, members bring together and, and to make decisions. 
Uh, we are really excited about the uh, Airflow UI modernization project, AIP38. And um, we're also you know, going to be um, uh, watching closely and trying to contribute to the manifest and remote DAG fetching uh, uh, process. So this is going to open up a lot of uh, you know, different use cases for our customers, especially where they need flexibility on how they store and version their DAGs and how they set up their local development process. And um, finally, the, the direction that the community is taking on granular access and permission controls for multi-tenancy, uh, we really love the direction that uh, we are taking on that. And we're excited to see how uh, you know, the whole software is going to evolve in that direction. Um, in terms of our contribution and involvement, I mean, we we just got started as a team. You know, we are really nascent in uh, you know uh, in a, in the way of where we are as a service. But what we are looking forward to is uh, direct involvement and contribution uh, from the MWA team directly to the Airflow community. So we have done a couple of those in recent past, and we are, we are trying to you know uh, do more in that regard. So we had an S3 bucket tagging operator written, um, and we also have a brand new EKS operator that is in the works, and you know, it's currently in code review stage. Uh, we really value the, the code quality and the integration test improvements uh, that we want to provide, not only to you know, the AWS provider packages, but Airflow's code code in general. And we, we're really committing to making sure that if Airflow is better, our customers are served better. So, so far we have about 4,500 lines of code. This is across Airflow, Moto, and Watchtower. You might think, okay, why Moto and Watchtower? So there is, those are means to an end. For example, if you talk about code quality and integration test, to have a really high bar of uh, you know, unit and integration test on the provider packages for AWS, you need to make sure that the Moto library, which is just a mock library for Moto, uh, has support for all of these newer services. So we are committing to adding code for Moto to make sure that we could write robust integration tests for any of the provider packages that we are touching on Airflow. And same thing with Watchtower. Um, we, are, we are committing to uh, making sure that we have uh, uh, customers have rich experience on logging uh, and integrating with, uh, with, with CloudWatch in that regards. And Watchtower is really important you know, in, in that aspect. And we want to make sure that uh, our customers whether they are on the managed service or not, have a great experience using uh, logging uh, on, on CloudWatch. So that said, uh, I want to leave with this thought uh, before we get into Q&A. This is an operating tenant. Uh, we, I mean, in Amazon, we usually write tenants of, uh, uh, of a team, uh, which really decides how we make decisions and how we make trade-offs and choices. This is the first tenant that we wrote for MWA, and it's, it's unanimously you know, the most important one in my opinion. Our customers are all current and future users of Airflow. There's, there's no question about it. And we want to help them to be successful, whether they are on the managed service or outside of it. I mean, that is the commitment that we have. And we are very sh sure that you know, um, the ability of the community to grow and uh, you know, will reflect on the product itself. Uh, and it, it's the same thing which I said before. Uh, the success to customers on Airflow is equal to success of uh, MWA customers. That's the, that's the way we see uh, the future with this. Yep. Or to you, John. Thanks so much. So uh, we'll open it up now for uh, for Q and A. Um, while Eric's pulling up some of those questions, um, you know, please, you know, both Subash and I are, are always on the uh, Airflow Community Slack channel. Um, any questions you post to uh, uh, Airflow AWS is usually uh, we'll be there to uh, to answer them as best we can, including a lot of other folks on the MWA team and also some of our SA specialists and folks like that. <laughs> 